2, read verses 11 to, I'm sorry, uh, 12 through the end of the chapter. This is Romans chapter 2, uh, verses 12 to the end of the chapter here in a little bit. Now, uh, uh, for those of you who were here last evening uh, with the Jonathan Alfred Vogue uh, concert, uh, you might remember that he uh, read at one time uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 1, and a few other verses, which begins, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that is a wonderful promise and a wonderful Talk Dick saying nothing compares to the promise I have in you, and this promise we have in Scripture is of great value and worth to us. And that is in Romans chapter 8. We're not there yet. <laughs> and I can't wait till we get to Romans chapter 8. It is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. Um, but this, that verse in Romans chapter 8 that begins that wonderful passage of Scripture. Uh, will mean so much more to us as we slog through these beginning chapters of Romans and we understand that there is no possible way that we can make it to our Lord and Savior, or make it to our God, no possible way that we can live up to His standards, um, that we are all trapped in sin. And then Jesus comes. Jesus comes. And then we hear Romans chapter. But we're not there yet. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't, I'm not apologizing for preaching this message here, but the, more of the past messages. But it leads us up to that point where we get to, to the wonder of what Christ has done. We're getting there, slowly but surely. But anyway, Romans chapter 2, verses 12 to 29. Uh, for all who have sinned up uh, sin without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. And I'm sorry. Uh, for it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves. Even though they do not have the law, they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on the day that when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. But if you call yourself a Jew, and rely on the law, and boast in God, and know His will, and approve what is excellent, because you are instructed from the law, and if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law dishonor God by breaking the law. For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemy among the Gentiles because of you. For circumcision indeed is of value if you obey the law. But if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. So if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have the written code and circumcision but break the law. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we worship you this morning, and we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, and that in him there is no condemnation. Yet, Lord, we know that when we look at your perfect law, we stand condemned because none of us can fully live up to that standard. But we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for all he has accomplished for us on the cross and in his life, his resurrection. So train our eyes to look to Him. And Lord, bring conviction.
conviction where conviction is needed. Bring encouragement where encouragement is needed. Bring salvation, Lord. I pray that you will fill me with your Holy Spirit and speak through me this morning. When I am weak, you are strong. In Jesus' name we give thanks and pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I am certainly no physician or doctor. However, I do know that there are some diseases and illnesses that do not show many outward symptoms at the first. There are certain cancers in particular that go unnoticed for quite a while until a checkup discovers them. A man might wake up in the morning, he goes down, he drinks his coffee, he goes on to work and he lives his day and he comes home um, and with his family, spends the evening with his family without any outward symptoms that there is a raging cancer within him. And it is not only, it is not until uh, that cancer is discovered in a checkup that will show itself or if it goes untreated, eventually some outward symptoms will begin to show. There is a spiritual parallel to this. A man might have been baptized as an infant, or a woman might have grown up in the church and attended BBS and other kids' programs. A man might dress up with a suit and tie on Sunday morning. A woman might volunteer for different ministries. They might even become members of the church and be nice enough. However, they still remain dead in their transgressions and sins. They have never come to a place where they have received Jesus as their Lord and Savior. They have an outward conformity to the Bible, but they do not have an inward change. They obey the letter of the law, but they do not have a new nature by the Spirit of God. And this passage of Scripture this morning confronts those with the law, whether they have the outward law of God or the inward law of conformity, confirmed by conscience, they might look good on the outside, but on the inside, a different change is needed, an inward change is needed, one that can be brought about only by the Spirit of the living God. So let us first begin where we left off last week, that God judges without partiality. We ended last week on the solemn note that there is no partiality with God. In verse 11 we read, For God shows no partiality, or God shows no favoritism, as other versions translate it. God does not play favorites. Rather, He will repay each of us according to what we have done or not done. He cannot be tricked. He cannot be bribed. He cannot be manipulated. He will not judge based on the color of our skin, our political alignment, our economic standing, our bank account, or lack of one, our sports team affiliations, our ins with people, or our outs with people. He does not do that. He is holy and He is just. And as a result, His judgment will be just and fair with no partiality or favoritism. He will, as we learned last week, render to each one according to His works. In this train of thought, we come to our passage this morning. We read in verses 12 to 13, For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law. This is the starting place of our passage this morning. In the scripture, in the final judgment, God will not show favoritism. He will not play favorites. He will judge according to the light that we have received, according to the truth that we know, but he will do so fairly. Thus, if someone has sinned without the knowledge of the Ten Commandments, without knowing that we are to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, or to love our neighbor as ourselves, if he has never heard the gospel before, uh, this person will perish without the law. We learn this in chapter 1, verses 18 to 32. This person, presumably without the law, still knew God existed because of creation. But he exchanged the image of God for something less for the created order. This is a pagan in some African or Indian village, or someone who has lived in the inner city all of his life. They have never heard anything about the Bible. They remain ignorant of it, yet they will still perish. A word that in this context has a nuance of everlasting destruction. They will still be held accountable. 
by what they did know and suffer the consequences for that. On the other hand, there are those who have the law and they will be judged according to the law. God will judge according to the knowledge that a person with the law has. And even though the Jews have the law and have a knowledge of that law, they are still held accountable before God. And God will judge them according to that law. They knew the Ten Commandments. They knew that they were to love the Lord God with all their being. They knew to love their neighbor as themselves. And yet they did not live up to that standard. They sinned against the law and therefore will be judged by that law. Greater privilege brings greater accountability, Colin Cruz said. The Lord God entrusted Israel with the law. This was a great privilege. And yet with this great privilege, there came a great responsibility. They knew it. Just like many today in America have the Bible and know of the Bible, perhaps have even read the Bible. We have been entrusted with it, and this privilege brings with it great accountability. And the Jewish people heard the law every time they went into the synagogue, when they went down the, the street to the, the building. And yet, as the Apostle Paul tells us, this is not enough. Verse 13, for it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. The Jewish man would have walked down to the synagogue and he would have heard the law being read. He would have heard the Ten Commandments. The Jewish woman would have walked down with her husband and heard the law. She would have known to love God with all of who she is. They would have heard that. But that is not enough. And is it not the same with us? There are many who will listen to God's Word this morning taught and preached and read. Yet it is never enough for a person to hear it. We must instead do it. We cannot read our Bibles, listen to all sorts of sermons online, but if we merely listen to them without taking them into heart and doing something with it, we are no better than the Jews before us. It is never enough to merely listen. Jesus made this plain with the parable of the wise and foolish builders. He said in Matthew 7 that um, everyone then who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Yes, the children's song. The wise man built his house on the rock. But the ones who hear the word and do not put them into practice, they are like the man who builds his house on the sand. It is never enough to just listen. James made the same point, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. And we deceive ourselves if all we do is read and listen to the Word of God and never take it, it never reaches home. And we just, okay, it goes in one ear and out the other. That won't do any good for us. We must act upon it by faith. Who will be justified before God? This passage answers, but the doers of the law will be justified. This word justified means declared righteous in God's sight. We'll see this word many times in the weeks to come. Now what does it mean that the doers of the law will be justified? Presumably the apostle means that those who walk in God's commandment and love God perfectly and love their neighbor perfectly, they will be the ones who will be justified. Some, some self-righteous person might be sitting there thinking, oh, oh that, I got that, I, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. I did all of that, but how much of the law do we have to keep? We read in Galatians 3.10, For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law, and do them. James 2.10, For whoever keeps the whole law but fails at one point has become guilty of it all. Only those who have never sinned one small bit will be justified before God by the works of the law. Now, 
you have done this, please come and talk to me because I'd like to know how you did that. I have not done that, and I probably can guess that you have not either. In order to be justified by the works of the law, you must obey everything perfectly. There must not be an ounce of sin, less than an ounce of sin in your life. There must not be any lie, even when you were a child. There must not be any disobedience to parents when you were a child. There must not be any of that. You must instead have loved God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, and not slacken in that one degree. Well, if, if that's the case, as it is, then nobody can be justified by the works of the law. So we have seen that God shows no partiality whether God, whether a person has the law or does not have it. All who sin without the law will be judged accordingly. Now let us look at the two case studies that Paul brings up. Case study A, those without the law. We read in verses 14 to 16, For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves. Even though they do not have the law, they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts. While their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on that, that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. Now, there are a few commentators, a few scholars who think that this refers to Gentile believers. Uh, one uh, whom I actually respect believes that. Um, they base this on the phrase, verse 15, written on their heart, and see it as an echo from Jeremiah 31 that describes the new covenant. This is a possibility, yet after pondering it and studying it and reading up on it, I still land on how uh, other, many others have taken it over the cent centuries. They are the Gentiles who do not have the law of Moses, but have an inward law in themselves. Let's make some observations about them. First, they are without the law. This becomes very plain in verse 14. These are the individuals that have never recited the Ten Commandments. They don't even know the Ten Commandments even exist. They don't know what it is to love God because they don't know about God. They are without the law. They have never attended a church or a synagogue down the street. That's just not available to them. They don't have it. Second observation, despite not having the law of Moses, they have this inward law in themselves. Notice that they do what the law requires, even though they, though they do not possess it, and these become a law to themselves. In verse 15, they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts. It is very clear that they do not have the law of Moses, so how do they know what the law requires? How is this possible? How do they do the things of the law without having the law? How is it the works of the law are written on their hearts? I think we find the answer at the very beginning of our Bibles. We are one, created in the image of God as per Genesis 1.27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. The Bible tells us that we have been created in the image of God. He shaped us, He fashioned us, He formed us. And even though the image of God is marred by sin, stained by sin, the Apostle James tells us that we are still in the likeness of God. And even though that image is stained by sin, I believe that there is still somewhat of a standard that we intuitively know, as it were, that the difference between what is right and wrong. Two, however, I, we also read that our first parents ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. When they eat, ate the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they became aware of what was right and what was wrong, what was good and what was evil. C.S. Lewis in, in one of the Chronicles of Narnia, when the white witch uh, who would later become the white witch, ate the, the fruit of the, the tree of life or whatever it was, um, and would have an unending days. Um, you know, some of the children asked ask them, hey, um, well, is she going to live forever? And he said something to the effect, well, the fruit always does 
what it's meant to do. And so it did in that case, it does today. Our parents ate that they became aware of right and wrong, and therefore that has been passed down to us. We understand what is right and wrong, and this is why Paul can say in Romans 1.32, though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. They have this inward law on themselves. Based on they are made in the image of God, and that our parents ate the tr from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. C.S. Lewis once observed, human beings all over the earth have this curious ideal that they ought to behave in certain ways and cannot really get rid of it. Therefore, those who do not have the law will do something that the law actually requires. Do not murder, for instance. They know not to do this. Or do not steal. They know not to do this. Because it's there on their hearts. Third, we observe that conscience testifies to them. We read their conscience bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. Conscience is the inner judge of a, of a man. It is, as one lexicon described it, the soul as distinguishing between what is morally good and bad, prompting to do the former and shun the latter, commending the one, condemning the other. It is this little voice inside of us that, that tells us, no, don't do that, or yes, do this. And sometimes we ignore it, and sometimes we go with it. It can be clear and good, but it can also be defiled and seared as with a hot iron. Conscience will bear witness with the works of the law that they are good. And so when we do something against God's law, then conscience will say no and condemn us with that. On the final day, as I understand this passage, a person's conscience will either ex accuse or excuse them. A word that has the nuance of absolving oneself or trying to get clear. In other words, conscience will remind us all that we knew of God's law, but refused to obey God's law. And this will take place, in, as we read in verse 16, on that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. All the inward accusations and excuses and defenses as to why we did what we did will come out on that day and be brought forward on that day. That day will reveal that those without the law had an inner law in and of themselves, and therefore they will be judged according to that. And their consciences will testify to it. And so Paul here reminds us that even though you did not have the law, you are still held accountable toward the inner law that you did have. All people are without excuse, even if they did not have a law. So, we see that God judges impartially. We have seen that those without the law will be held accountable. Now, let's look at the case study B, those with the law. For this, we turn our attention to the next section, and we read in verses 17 to 20, but if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will and approve what is excellent because you are instructed from the law, and if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth. So let's uh, observe the characteristics of those with the law. This describes the Jewish person. This is, uh, in the first, they have many privileges. And the first privilege is that they, they have the right name. They call themselves Jews. They are descended from Abraham by their ethnicity. They are part of God's chosen people in the past. And in case we think that this is a this is that that's them, um, could we not say that it describes people in America as well? Sometimes people have the name Christian because they grew up in the Bible Belt. Sometimes they had Christian parents, or they think America is a Christian nation, and therefore, since I am an American, I am a Christian. They have the right name, as it were. 
The second privilege is that they have the law. They have the law, they know his will and approve of what is excellent because you are instructed from the law. These are those who not only have their Bibles, but know their Bibles. They quote chapter and verse. They know where things are at in the Bible. They can tell you the stories and the major stories of it. They rely on the law. They rely on their Bibles. And as Jesus said in John, said to the Jews in John 5, 39 to 40, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. They knew their Bibles, but sadly, sadly, they missed the point of the Bible. The point is Jesus. Go to Him and have life in Him. The third privilege is that they boasted of the true God. They boasted in Him, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They boasted about their knowledge in Him. They had the covenant with Him. Some churches today boast about knowing God, or, or they, will, they will wear their Christian t-shirts, they will listen to their Christian music, but they will never have a personal relationship with God. And it's very much like someone boasting in an actor or actress, or a sports, sports figure, a sports hero, or even, even the leader, a world leader. They, they boast of him, yeah, this guy is so great, this guy is so great, but they don't know him. And that's kind of what Paul is saying. You boast about this God, but you do not have that relationship with Him. Another, another observation we see is that they are convinced that they are teachers. We read in verse 19 to 20, And if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind and a light uh, to those in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, since they have the law, since they have their Bibles, as it were, they are the Sunday school teachers, they are the pastors, they are the seminary professors. They taught because they had this. They are confident in their ability to tell others how they must follow God and obey His commands, as one commentator said. Very much like the Pharisees, they knew it all, and they instructed them. But... Paul comes to verses 21 to 23, we see something entirely different. They had all of these privileges, yet we see that in their heart of hearts, they are hypocrites. There we read, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, dishonor God by breaking the law. The Apostle Paul asked four rhetorical questions meant to drive home the point that not all was well with them. And the Jews were hypocrites. A hypocrite is one who sets the standard for something and then yet it lives an entirely different life. They do not practice what they preach. They declare they do not steal. And while they might not have dressed up in, in dark clothes and, and opened the window at night to rob something, they stole in other ways. He said, do not commit adultery. And yet, they cast a lustful glance at a woman or maybe divorce their wives to get a better wife. They say, do not bow down to idols. And yet, they are irreverent, irreverent to God and dishonor Him by the way that they live their lives. They relied and boasted in the law. However, they dishonored God by breaking that very law. Their life was contrary to what the word said. Thus, we have in verse 24, as it is written, the name of God is blasphemy among the Gentiles because of you. This is a quote from Isaiah 52, 5. The ESV reads, their rulers wail, declares the Lord, and continually, all the day, my name is despised. We get a clearer understanding of this in Ezekiel 36, 20. But when they came to the nations, wherever they came, they profaned my holy name, in that the people said of them, These are the people of the Lord, and yet they had to go out of his land? Christopher Ash put it this way, The rest of the world looks at God's people in exile. They know it is punishment for sin. They conclude that Israel's God isn't much of a God, since even his people don't honor his standards. Just so today, irreligious unbelievers look at religious unbelievers 
and conclude that the God they claim to follow isn't much of a God. Those who claim they are Christians by whatever standard they use and yet live in contrary to the gospel discredit and dishonor God. They claim they are Christian because their parents are Christian, or they were baptized as an infant, or they attended church when they were young. Yet their lives are no better than the next door neighbor who claims atheism. And those who do such thing, they blaspheme in the name of God. They dishonor His holy name. So we have seen that God judges without partiality. Then we looked at two case studies, those without the law and those with the law. And they stand before an impartial God, giving account of themselves to Him. No one can escape. And change is needed in the heart. And this is where we go. The Gentiles who do not have the law have the inner law stamped upon them. They know God's righteous decrees and yet refuse to do them. Therefore they will perish. On the other hand, the Jews had all the privileges. But they refuse to obey. And therefore they will be judged according to that. Now the Apostle Paul brings up one more aspect of the Jews to show that an inward change is needed. This aspect is the sign of circumcision. This was the sign of the covenant that the Lord gave Abraham in Genesis chapter 17. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. Circumcision was a sacred sign to the Jews. It was a visible sign that declared who belonged to the people of God. Find the sign given to Abraham in Genesis 17, 14. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. And so the Jew was, took pains to be circumcised. Yet the Apostle says in verse 25, For circumcision indeed is a value if you obey the law, but if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. Notice the little word if in this passage. Circumcision only has value if you keep the word, keep the law, maintain all of it. Thus, if a circumcised Jew broke any ounce of the law, they would be considered as uncircumcised. Now, now, we don't fully grasp what Paul is saying, but this is a very shocking statement to the Jews. Cruz summed it up in his commentary for Paul to say that the circumcision of Jews who disobeyed the law had become uncircumcision was tantamount to saying that they were no better than pagan Gentiles. Again, for a Jew reading this, this would have shocked them. It would have been like saying, every time you get a speeding ticket, you, are, you commit treason against the United States. It would be as if you were burning the American flag. That is what Paul is saying. It is a harsh statement to wake them up and say, hey, not even circumcision is worth anything if you disobey God's law. Yet again, this is not a random attack from the Apostle Paul. Where did he get this idea from? The prophet Jeremiah said, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will punish all those who are circumcised in the flesh, Egypt, Judah, Edom, the sons of Ammon, Moab, for all these nations are uncircumcised, and all the house of Israel are uncircumcised in heart. This was foretold by the prophets long ago. The apostle continues in verse 26, So if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his circumcision be regarded as circumcision? And so Paul is saying, hey, if you are circumcised, a circumcised Jew, and break the law, you are no better than a pagan Gentile. If you are a Gentile, and I presume here a believer, and yet keep the law, then you are like a believing, circumcised Jew. That is what Paul is saying to them. And he goes on in verse 27, then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have written 
have the written code and uncircumcision, but break the law. And the uncircumcised Gentile and here, most likely a believer, will stand in judgment against the Jew who had everything and yet failed to keep the law, failed to obey, failed to see Christ in the law. And then the apostle writes in verse 28 to 29, For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. Here the apostle shows the stark reality, an inward change is needed to be part of the people of God. The Jews had the law and the sign of the covenant. They had the outward sign of it, but they disobeyed the, the law and were not a part of the people of God. Yet the apostle declares that a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. What does this mean? It means a change of heart is needed. We have to be circumcised in the heart by the spirit. Well, what does this mean? Without going into too much detail, circumcision of the flesh cut off the foreskin of the male organ. When a heart was circumcised, it was figurative language of something being cut off. Well, what is that something? Deuteronomy 10, 16, Moses commanded the Israelites, circumcise therefore the foreskin of your hearts and be no longer stubborn. Stubbornness is one thing cut off as it were. Jeremiah 4.4 4 says, Circumcise yourselves to the Lord. Remove the foreskin of your hearts, O men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Lest my wrath go out, go forth like fire and burn with none to quench it because of the evil of your deeds. An uncircumcised heart is one that is stubborn, refuses to listen to God's word. It is one who commits evil deeds and is under the wrath of God. So when that is cut off in Christ, by the Spirit of God, your heart is circumcised. It means the renewal and purification of the heart, as one commentator said. Yet we cannot do this in our own strength. We can try to get rid of sin. We can try to peel it from us, but it will not work. How does it, it, how does it get rid of? The Lord God commands it of us, but we do not have the power to get rid of it. And so Moses understood this. In Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, he says, And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring, so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, that you may live. Moses knew, as the prophets knew, as the apostles knew, that we cannot do it in our own strength. We cannot get rid of our sin. We need God to do it. And He does this by the Spirit of the living God. Only He can cut it off, as it were, and so that we are saved. The Apostle Paul understands this, and therefore he says here that the heart is circumcised by the Spirit, not by the letter. In other words, the Holy Spirit is the agent of change in us. He is the agent who circumcises the heart, who purifies us, who comes in and we become new creations of Christ. In Christ. The Jews who had the law and the circumcision boasted to others about the privilege. But those who are circumcised in heart, they don't want the praise of man. They want the praise of God. So we have seen that God shows no favoritism. Those without the law will perish, and those with the law will be judged accordingly. We need a change of heart, and this cannot come about except by God through His Spirit. We can say we do not have a law, but we still fall under judgment. We have our word, the Bible, and yet, if we do not obey it fully, we fall under judgment. We need, we need a change of heart, the necessity of a heart change. And this is where we come. We come and we cry out to the Lord and say, Lord, I need a new heart. I cannot get rid of my past. I cannot get rid of my regrets. I cannot get rid of my sin. I need a new heart. And we cry out to Him. Seek Him. Seek Him. We 
need to understand that there is no way we can make it on our own to Him. We need the Spirit of God to do the delicate surgery in our hearts. That is what we need. And if you are this morning and you don't know the Lord, if you say, yeah, I am that person, I know the Bible, I've grown up in church, but I don't know Him, then go find Him, seek Him, know Him, cry out to Him, call upon the name of Jesus Christ who died for your sin, and you will be saved. Those of you who, who know Him and have believed in Him, have trusted Him, whose praise will you live for? Will you live for the praise of man? Or will you live for the praise of God? Will you live to hear others say, hey, you did a great job, hey, wow, that prayer was amazing, wow, that was so great. Or will you live to hear God say to you, well done, my good and faithful servant. Whose praise will you live for? Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we cannot make it on our own. What we need is that change of heart. And I pray that you will grant it to us. Lord, I pray that you will chart our lives so that we live for the glory of God and that we live for your praise, not the praise of man. We cannot do this in our own strength. We need you, O oh Lord. And I pray that you will come to us. Bless your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.